We're in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we're still in the first 10 verses. And uh, so uh, we're going to read uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 10 once again and uh, continue uh, with our look at these, uh, these verses. This is an important passage. Uh, if you've got uh, a new international version, as I guess most of you have probably got in front of you, uh, you'll see there's a heading there, Made Alive in Christ. What could be more important for us as human beings who were still born into this world? We had no life, spiritually speaking, of our own. And uh, God saw to it that there was the chance, the opportunity for us to receive a new life. And that's what this passage is all about. So it is a really important section uh, of Paul's letter. The whole letter is important. I've said uh, on a number of occasions that probably second only to the book of Romans, uh, that Ephesians probably lays out Paul's theology uh, um, uh, in more detail uh, than anything else that he wrote. Um, so it can be a bit hard going in places. Um, and true to form with Paul's letters, the first half of the book, so in this case chapters 1, 2, and 3, uh, are all dedicated to, to looking at his uh, theology, the theory, if you like, of what it means to be alive in Christ. And the last three chapters uh, deal with uh, what it's like to actually live it practically. And so we long to get to chapter 4. And I know we're still only in the first 10 verses. And I reckon by my calculations, it'll be about 2021 20, before we get to... Um, I'm only joking. Um, but there we go. Let's go and see how we do. So here we go. Ephesians chapter 2 and uh, starting at verse 1. As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Well, I want to look very specifically uh, this week at verse 7. And um, in verse 7 it tells us that the reason that God raised us up and seated us with Christ, which is what we looked at uh, last week, and we looked at how uh, uh, Christ's throne in heaven is your throne in heaven. Uh, scripture tells us on a number of places that we looked at that uh, when we get there, he doesn't just say, take a seat in the grandstand, and look on, he says, come and join me on my throne. That's quite a thought. But why did God do this? This is the question that we're going to try and answer today. And that uh, is addressed in verse 7. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I want to just remind you uh, again of some of the things that we said. I don't want to go over everything every single week, every detail, because you know we're, we're, we're going to spend uh, you know half an hour just recapping if we're not careful. But sometimes there are relevant bits of information that we've covered in the past that are, are going to come up again, and so uh, let me just talk to you um, uh, just for a moment about what we talked about um, in the earlier part. 
of uh, chapter 2. And in fact, in verse 1, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And we, we discussed uh, what the meaning is behind these two words, transgressions and sins. Transgressions, we said, was a deviation from the path. Literally, your foot slipped off the path. Um, uh, but I want you to just remind you of the definition of the word behind sin, uh, amatia. And the word here means to have missed the mark, to have fallen short of the mark. And it might be used of an archer firing the arrows. And as he shoots the arrows, there's a target in the distance and the arrow doesn't make it to the target. It drops before it gets there and it lands too early. Um, and that's what sin is. And so we said that sin, uh, although it is, you know, all sorts of things that we do that are wrong, there's no doubt about that, but that is not primarily uh, the definition of, of sin or what uh, sin is. Sin is primarily what you don't do right. Okay, so there's a difference there. Uh, the reason that you do things that are wrong is not because, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, or, for, or it is rather because you are already a sinner. Um, it's not that you did things wrong that made you a sinner. So therefore the psalmist says, I was born in sin. I was already a sinner when I came into this world. Before I did anything right or wrong, I would have already fallen short of the glory of God. And uh, as, as Romans puts it, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So sin is this idea that we are unable to attain uh, the glory, the perfection of God. We can't reach it. No matter how much you try, no matter how good you are, no matter how many good deeds you do, you will never, ever reach the greatness and the glory and attain the height of God. It's absolutely impossible. You're doomed before you start. And the sad thing is that there are still so many people in this world who are trying by works to earn their way into God's good book. They're still trying it. Uh, and so, you know, if you challenge uh, an awful lot of people on their position with Christ, they will defend it by saying, I'm not a bad person. You could press that a bit further. What do you mean you're not a bad person? Well, I don't do bad things. In fact, they might even say, put it... Uh, more positively, I try to do good things. And that's how people act. They, they think that by doing that, they're all right. And that is self-justification. That we are looking at ourselves and saying, I'm not actually that bad compared to what? Compared to the other people around me, presumably. That's the only measure that you've got. So I look at the people around me and I say, you know, um, those people are not as good as I am, or I am equally as good as they are. Um, uh, or I try to do better than the, the people around me. Now, that's a noble thing, but it's not a righteous thing. It's noble in the sense that, of course, we should want to do good to all people. The scripture tells us that. Um, do good to all people, especially to those of the household of believers. But... That is not good enough. We still have to deal with the point that when the arrow was shot, it fell short. It didn't make it to the target. What are we going to do about that? And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. And so uh, I want you just to, to, to keep that in the back of your minds for now, because uh, as we move on, uh, we're going to see why that's now important to today's argument. Um, so here we go into verse 7. Um, God, he's raised us up from the dead. Uh, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. Uh, we were actually showing and displaying and proving that we were uh, completely spiritually dead by the way in which we conducted our lives. And you might be looking at yourself saying, hang on a minute. I'm not going to tell anybody here, but I still do things that are wrong. That's my little secret. <laughs> 
Um, well, you know, it might be something that you're aware of, but the truth is that we all know that you do things that are wrong. Now, I'm not saying I know specifically, but what we know is that all of us are still people who are susceptible to do things that are wrong. We're still sinners. We're still trying to, to uh, uh, you know, walk uh, with Christ and to follow him and we make mistakes and our foot slips from the path from time to time. We know that goes on. But uh, I would just say, actually, I think this is very helpful. I, I once heard uh, a pastor uh, uh, talking on this subject and, and he said this. Um, you know, he was talking about people who feel so much guilt, Christians who feel so much guilt because they're still battling with sin and um, it, it is absolutely true that uh, from time to time uh, and for some of us more than others that we are battling away and we just don't know how to cope uh, because we keep going back to the same things we know we're forgiven but we keep going back again and again and I just found it quite helpful that this particular pastor talking uh, on this subject um, uh, he said, uh, I want you to think, though, about not so much concentrating on the fact, oh, dear, I slipped up again, but how do you feel about how you slipped up again? Do you take the attitude, I slipped up again, but it's okay, it's all right, there's enough grace to cover it, that I know every sin's forgiven, so it's all right, I don't need to worry about it? Or are you remorseful about that? He says, are you in that situation where you know when you slip up that you just go back sorrowfully before the Lord and just saying, I wish I hadn't done that. I really wish I could get a grip on this. I really wish that I wouldn't keep going back. I really wish that this kind of magnetic pull upon me, that every time I think that I've escaped it and I'm, I'm living victoriously, it pulls me back in and before I know it, I've tripped again. He said, because if that is how you respond when you slip up and disappoint the Lord and dishonor him, he said, then that shows that his spirit is still at work in you. It shows that there is a work of sanctifi sanctification still taking place. Because if it wasn't, you would just say, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Uh, my sins are forgiven uh, I don't need to worry about it. So I think that that's, that's a really helpful way of looking at it. How do I react when I trip up? Am I uh, you know, sad about that? Am I remorseful about that? Um, or do I just brush it off as it's of no real consequence? But anyway, let's, let's move on. Um, because uh, what we find here is that, that having raised us from the dead with Christ, forgiven our sins, uh, and then seated us, uh, on this throne that he has, and we looked at some verses last week for that, uh, that, that show us that he, he, he literally says, I want you to be sitting on the same throne with me. There's enough space for you here. And uh, that's a, an amazing blessing that God has given to us. And so he says, I've done all of that for this reason. In order that in the coming ages, and notice that's plural, in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. The coming ages. That means uh, it's, it's a word that, that we, uh, fr from which we get uh, our word eon, meaning a very long period. We might talk about something being, you know, eons long. You probably all go home and say Keith's sermons are eons long. Um, and, you know, it just goes on forever and ever and ever. And we might talk about a long period of time. And so when he's talking about the ages here, he's not talking about time as in a set period of time. He's talking about beyond uh, anything that time really measures. He's talking beyond seasons. Um, uh, we touched on that um, this week a little bit, looking at our verse for the week. Uh, and the times that were mentioned there, and, and so, uh, and in that passage. Um, and it's not a kahiros moment, a season. Uh, it's, it's talking about, you know, these endless times, but they're ages. More than one 
So he's not just talking about eternity to come. I believe he's talking about from here and now. And you might not understand this as I don't understand this, but there is a sense in which that as Christ has taken his place, that you are already seated with him on that throne. How can that be? Because you're still here on earth. And you might say, but surely I only take my position on that throne when I get to glory. That's true. Of course it is. Um, you know, apart from, of course, we have finite minds and we can't understand God's infinite uh, nature. The fact that he's outside of time. But look, here's the thing. That even before the creation of this world, there was a throne already in heaven. And on that throne sat the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father is there. The Holy Spirit is there. They're all there on that throne. But what we may not realize is that right from that time, that there was a place reserved for you there too. It had your name on it. Literally, it was a space saved for you. Because as they look into the whole of uh, time and eternity, God is able to look and to say, one day I will need a space for this person, for that person. And he names them by name. And Jesus says, I need room on my throne for all of you, name by name. And you're going to have your place. It's reserved. It's just for you. Nobody can take it. And that fits in with this um, great doctrine that we've often talked about of election and predestination. The fact that God knows uh, the end from the beginning, that nothing is a surprise to him, that, that he had you in his hands even before he created you. He knew all about you. He knew the choices you'd make in life. He knew whether you would accept or reject um, the message of the gospel. And he knew that whether you would need a place or not, in glory. Now, if he's got a place for you, it's absolutely secure. I can tell you one thing for absolutely sure, that there is not going to be a single spare seat when we get to heaven. You know, the Bible talks uh, in a couple of places about a full number of people. Um, don't get stuck on exact numbers. Don't start thinking, ah, is that what the 144,000 people are all about uh, that speaks about in Revelation? Because if you do that, uh, you know, number one is you've misunderstood the passage. Number two is you suddenly uh, become like the Jehovah's Witnesses and start trying as hard as you can to make sure you get your place because there's only 144,000 of them. And let's be honest about it, over the years there's been an awful lot of Christians who've walked upon this earth. An awful lot of believers. Um, he's not speaking about that. In fact, he speaks about an enormous crowd that no one could count. He says, that's how many there are. So don't even try counting. There is plenty of room. But look, here's the thing. That when uh, God is, is going to call time on this earth, he will do it at exactly the right moment. Not a moment before, not a moment too late. He will do it when every single person whose throne a position is reserved in glory is already safely accounted for. And at that time, I believe, is when the Lord returns. It's at that time that he says time is up on this earth. And he won't do it to uh, you know, a moment too soon. But I think that... Um, uh, you know, Jesus has, has taught that too. Uh, you know, when we think about um, some of the parables that Jesus taught, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the parable of, of the banquet. And you remember the, the parable there that Jesus taught uh, and told. And he said, you know, he went out and he invited all the dignitaries. And, and um, uh, when the dignitaries came up with all their excuses as to why they couldn't come to the banquet, um, uh, the master of the house, the king, he, he gets really upset with that and he says to his servants, I want you to go out 
into the highways and the byways and, byways and compel them to come in. And so they go out and they invite everybody they can possibly get. Um, and he says, my house is still not full. You know, go out, get more. Because my house has to be full. And when God fills his house, and say there are no spare seats, none whatsoever. Um, so you need to be sure, absolutely confident um, in your own faith and understanding that your seat is reserved. And uh, don't rest until you are absolutely confident uh, that that is the case. And so we have now these seats reserved. Your name is on it. And he says, even from now, he says, I am displaying the manifold wisdom that I have to the heavenly realms. That's how scripture describes it. That God is displaying the manifold wisdom of God to all of the, the, the uh, uh, heavenly beings. Now, I think that's talking about the angelic beings, yes, that are with God now. But I actually think that uh, in some way, and, and, and again, we don't fully understand how this works. Um, Satan has been cast out of heaven. You know, does he see back into heaven? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that he does. But I think what he does see is this, that Satan, who we're told, uh, prowls around the earth like a roaring lion. That's now his domain. What does he see? He doesn't see your throne exactly in heaven, but what he sees is you. And he sees the amazing work of God, the grace of God at work in your lives. And he knows those that God has chosen for himself. He can see those that he has picked out and that God has separated out the sheep from the goats, so to speak. He can see the difference between you as a believer and somebody else as a non-believer. He is not fooled. We might fool one another. We might sometimes even kid ourselves. But trust me, he knows. He's an expert at looking for um, uh, God's flock. He sees them. And he will do whatever he can uh, to uh, try and destroy those people. But what he sees is that God is taking people like you and me, who we might have washed our hands of, and he says, I am making them daily into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's quite a thought. Now, just think about how Jesus um, uh, came to this earth. He walked upon here um, uh, for uh, a few years of, of ministry, and in that time, he gathered to himself disciples. Now, when you start to look at the disciples that Jesus chose, um, any other human being would not have chosen those men. They had so many issues, so many problems, completely uneducated, um, uh, you know, Peter very often acted like a complete buffoon. Um, I mean, why would you have him, and particularly as he was going to become the prominent one, uh, why would you have somebody like Judas who you knew was going to turn his back upon you? Uh, why would you have somebody like Thomas um, who would just struggle with belief? Um, uh, you know, why, why, why? Why would you have all these people? Why would you not go and pick somebody like, for example... Um, as we sometimes call him, the rich young ruler. Um, I mean, he would have been a great candidate, wouldn't he, for Jesus' disciples? I mean, he was well-educated, he was wealthy, so he could have contributed to uh, the mission. Um, uh, he, uh, you know, he was well-versed in the scriptures. Uh, he led a very pious life. Uh, and, you know, he came to Jesus one day, almost volunteering to become part of the inner circle. And Jesus turned him away. Not because of the, Jesus didn't like the qualities that he had, but because, you know, Jesus had already picked the ones that he was going to work with. Jesus didn't necessarily turn his back on educated people. I suspect that uh, you know, Matthew was highly educated, for example. 
Paul himself speaks about those that had come to faith. And he says uh, to the church, I think it's the Corinthian church, isn't it? Um, but I may be wrong on that. When he says, you know, not many of you were noble when you were called. Not many of you were of distinguished people. Not many of you were notable. He says, you were nobodies when you were called to the grace of God. And that is true of the majority of people, even to this day, who are called to follow Jesus. We're ordinary people. We're nothing special. We're just, you know, people going about our lives in an ordinary manner. But he puts his love upon us and he takes us out of the crowd and uh, singles us out uh, for salvation. It's an amazing thought of what God does. And in doing that, um, what he's doing is he's showing to all of the, the spiritual world that's out there that's watching what God is doing and saying, you might think that I'm a fool for taking the lowly and raising them up, for taking the humble and putting them on a pedestal, for taking those who are weak and making them strong. But look, what God is doing is this. He's showing that he, in his almighty power, can take the most uh, insignificant of people in this world and turn them into something for his glory. Isn't that amazing? that there is still chance and opportunity for anyone and everyone, that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. He even sometimes takes those who seem to be the worst people on this planet and he turns them around, transforms their life. And he kind of laughs, if you like, at Satan and says, see what I've done to that one. You thought that that person was doomed. You thought there was no hope. I'm going to show you how great my power is. And in that way, what is happening is it's like God is displaying his power through us and showing uh, you know, th this amazing richness of what he has to offer. Um, and that should be a tremendous encouragement for each and every one of us. And so starting now and going on through all of eternity, there will be awe and wonder that God has saved who he has saved, that God has saved the number he has saved. When you think that there was not one of us that was worthy to be saved, and yet we're told that sitting on that throne in heaven with him will be such an enormous number that nobody can actually count them. That's how great God's riches are. Now, I want to look, though, and see this, it's, uh, to, sh to show you this. Um, this incomparable riches, this is a fascinating word. Um, uh, the word that's actually used here, uh, it's, it's kind of, if you like, two words put together. Um, uh, hooper bolo. And uh, hooper means over, and bolo uh, is to throw. Um, so what he's saying is to throw over. Now, remember that sin was to fall short, to miss the mark. And here, these incomparable riches of God's grace, he's saying that he's got so much grace that he goes beyond the target. He throws beyond it. He goes over it. You fell short and he went beyond. Isn't that amazing? He says that, you know, this is the level that I was expecting. Um, you shot the arrow, if you like. It fell way short of the target. So I did it on your behalf. And when I did it, it went way beyond it, it didn't miss the light. It went straight through it beyond. I just showed that I was so much greater than you could ever imagine. And so he says, there is enough grace for you. He says, I have got so much that I can go beyond what is expected. I mean, this to me is just fantastic that here we are looking and saying, but I'm not perfect. I'm not up to God's standards. And God says, I'm not just going to make you up to my standard. I'm going to take you way beyond anything that I could even... I mean, that to me is remarkable. How does he do that? Well, here's the thing, you see. If he was going to make you just good enough, just to hit the target and hit the target alone, what he would do is he would forgive your sins. He would give you a new life. He would welcome you into his kingdom. And that would be it. You would just be a subject of his kingdom. But look, the riches of his grace is this. 
that he didn't just save you, but he then poured out so many blessings that you did not deserve. This is the difference, I think, between grace and mercy. Mercy is the fact that God is lenient with us when he should uh, be much harsher with us. And grace is to say that he gives us much more than we ever deserved. And um, let me just read to you actually from uh, Psalm 103, um, because I I think it fits in so beautifully with this passage. Um, And uh, reading from verses 8 to 12, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father, I'm going to read verse 13 too. I think this is great. Uh, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He's showing his compassion. He goes on to say he knows our frailty. He knows that we are formed from the dust of the earth. He knows that we are weak, and yet he still shows his compassion upon us, that he removes our sins, not just taking them away from us, but as far as the east is from the west. He says as far as you could possibly imagine, he's taken away everything that is wrong in you. And he has given you, in place of that, a righteousness that does not belong to you. And he has made you and clothed you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He says, therefore, every benefit that belongs to Jesus, he says, you are also going to benefit from too. So he welcomes you into his kingdom as a forgiven person. And he says, I don't just want you to just become a citizen of heaven. He says, first of all, he says, I'm going to adopt you into the family. I'm going to be able to call you my very own child. That's the first thing. See, this is where his grace goes way beyond the target. The target is to forgive you. The target is that you need to have new life. And if he can forgive you and give you new life, the target is reached. But he says, then I'm going to go beyond. I'm going to throw beyond. I'm going to give you uh, adoption into my family. And he says, and when I adopt you into the family, he says, Every right of a a child of mine is yours too. Now, in the family, uh, there was only one heir. So if you take, for example, the the account of uh, Jacob and Esau when they were born, and you remember that Esau was the firstborn, and then he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Um, And uh, basically, he lost all his blessings to Jacob. Now, we know Jacob was a deceiver. Uh, and he didn't do everything honorably. Um, but that aside, all of the blessings that should have been Esau, he passed on uh, to Jacob uh, so easily. And Jacob inherited the blessing instead of his twin and slightly older brother, the firstborn, uh, Esau. When we come into Christ, the firstborn is Jesus. And we're not even twins with him. He is the firstborn. Therefore, he is the one who inherits everything. He is the one who is the, the, the heir to all that belongs to the Father. And yet in Christ, he says, I'm going to make you joint heirs, co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs. That everything that belongs to him is yours. So he's adopted you into the family, and now he's made you a joint heir with his one and only son. Now, Jesus could, of course, have kicked up a fuss and said, hang on a minute. Why give it to them? I actually went to that earth to die for them that the target might be reached. And now the decision is to give them everything that belongs to me. But Jesus doesn't act like that because there's nothing selfish within him. In fact, he longs to give to his brothers and sisters as well. He says, I want you to have what is mine. I want you to be part of this. That's why you have a place on his throne with him, that we may rule with him. He says, everything is mine. It's yours. This throne, it's yours. You're in me. And therefore, being in Christ, in him, everything that is Christ is yours. Christ. 
And this is just such an amazing thing that God shows the, uh, the incomparable riches of his grace. We're going to have to deal with exactly what grace is a little bit more when we come to verse 8. We've mentioned it a number of times and in chapter 1 too. Um, but, um, you know, uh, verse 8 tells us it's by grace you've been saved. And that's a very well-known verse. So I'm uh, trying not to um, uh, go too far ahead with describing grace. But I, I think I just need to say uh, just a couple of moments on this. That grace, it seems to me, is an abstract concept. And I think for that reason that many of us uh, find that very difficult. What do I mean by that? Um, It's not something physical. Um, You know, I have in my hand here a a device, an electronic device, a Kindle. um, And uh, you may not understand what a Kindle is. Um, And uh, perhaps you do, but I mean, you may not know what a Kindle is. Uh, And if you don't, I could take this Kindle to you and I could say to you, I'll tell you what, let me give you a quick lesson in how to use the Kindle um, and maybe, uh, you know, bring it back next week. I'll leave it with you for a week. You can play with it and uh, you can uh, read some of the books that are on there and and just experiment with it Um, and then you will understand what a Kindle is. You can't do that with grace. I can't say to you, you know, here is an object, this is grace, go and play with it uh, until you understand it. And so I think there's a lot of misunderstanding or a lot of um, uh, perhaps not full understanding of what grace actually is. I I did a study of the word grace um, through the scriptures this week. And as I was going through there, the one thing that really struck me is that we don't really see much of a mention of grace until we come to Paul's writing. I mean, it is there occasionally, but until you get to Paul's writing, we don't really see much of grace. And I would estimate that um, uh, of the hundred or so references to grace throughout Scripture, uh, probably I would say one-fifth of those are all in Paul's writings, um, and the rest are outside. The majority are in the New Testament, um, and in fact, until you get to, to Paul's writings, there are only about 20 references to grace right up from the beginning of Genesis right through. You'll find that there is only one reference that I found uh, to God's grace uh, as, as in, in, in a saving grace uh, mentioned uh, in Scripture in the Old Testament uh, in the Psalms. Um, there's one of the, um, the prophets kind of mentions something, but I don't think it's really speaking about a saving grace. Um, It's talking about a different kind of grace that God had upon Jerusalem. but So there's not much of it in the Old Testament mentioned. Um, Occasionally it talks about God's graciousness um, and that he acts graciously. Um, But when you come into the New Testament, again, you don't find much in the Gospels mentioned of grace. It's when you get to Paul's writing that suddenly we find grace is spoken about again and again. The book of Romans speaks about grace many times. The book of Ephesians speaks about grace many times. Now, I said that Romans and Ephesians are probably the best examples of, of Paul explaining his, the theory of, of uh, understanding God, the theology of God. Therefore, it's significant, I think, that it's Romans and Ephesians that mention grace perhaps more than any other books in scripture. This is a concept that we need to understand. It covers so much that when we talk about God has forgiven our sins, we're talking about the grace of God. You did not deserve to have your sins forgiven, but God forgave you anyway. Uh, When we talk about um, the fact that God has blessed us, whatever that blessing might be, that's an idea of the grace of God. We have something that we talk about um, uh, sometimes in theological circles of common grace. And we mean that this is God's blessing that anybody, whether they're a believer or not, can experience. The fact that the sun rises and brings warmth to the earth is a common grace. The fact that the rain comes and waters the earth and causes the plants to grow is a common grace, as we call it. We're talking about things that anybody can experience, but they're a blessing from God. And anything you experience that we could say we do not deserve, it's not our right to have it, but God puts it upon us, this is an idea of God's grace. 
And what God has done for you is he has poured out so much grace, grace upon grace. John uh, in chapter one speaks and uses that phrase. Now he's speaking there about there was a grace already in place, he says, and that was in fact uh, given to Moses in the law. Now, I don't think there were many people in the Old Testament who thought of the law of God as being grace. Hence, you don't find grace mentioned much in the Old Testament. But John singles it out and he says, that was grace because God was being gracious to those people and giving them a set of rules that would keep them uh, on the straight and narrow to follow him. And it was a blessing to them. They didn't realize it, but it was a blessing to them. But now he says that in Jesus, he's put another grace on top of the first grace. He's poured out grace upon grace. And what we find is that now we could say that he's poured out grace upon grace upon grace. Because what he's done is, is he's given you everything that you need in order to receive eternal life and so much more. He just keeps pouring out his grace. And uh, you do not deserve, and I do not deserve, to have anything of blessing from God whatsoever. What we deserve, as he says here, and we read here in chapter 2, is that we were by very nature objects of wrath of God, objects of the anger of God, that we actually deserve to have him pouring out nothing but his absolute fury upon us. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he shows you his kindness. And so, the riches of God's grace, which is unlimited grace, there is no limit to it at all. He just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And you're in receipt of that, and you're in receipt of that now. This isn't something you have to wait for later on. You'll you're keep on receiving. But even now, you're in receipt of God's grace. And I want you to get excited about the whole idea that God does not treat us as our sins deserve, as we read in Psalm 103. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Instead, he pours out more grace upon us. He knows our weaknesses, he understands our frailties, and still pours out his grace upon us. He acts in total kindness to us because of his great love for us, which is another example of his grace. If you're not sure about God's grace, if you don't fully understand it, I want to encourage you to, to explore it more. So we're going to come on to that a bit more next week, but, but I want you to explore it more. I want you to understand that God wants not just the best for you, but the very best. The best that he could possibly give to you, he wants for you. Are you prepared to receive it? Are you excited to receive it? Are you ready and willing to just receive God's blessing poured out upon your life? Because if God is in control, if he's at work in you, Everything he pours out upon you is an example of his grace. He never does anything to harm you. He never does anything that's going to, in the long term, do you uh, a disservice. He just pours out uh, undeserved favor again and again. Let's pray.